All right, 1 Peter chapter 5, please, 1 Peter chapter 5, if you would. And when you find your place, if you're able to, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word, 1 Peter chapter 5. And let's start in verse number 6. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 6, and we'll read down to verse number 10. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. And be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Father, help us to, to grasp the truths that you will put forth this morning from your word. Help me, Lord, organize my thoughts. And give me clarity of mind and clarity of speech. The Lord, doesn't do any good if I say things, but it's not understandable. And that, to me, is what I truly want, Lord, for folks to understand what the word of God is teaching and, and thereby, Lord, uh, engraft it, Lord, into their life. So please, do what I cannot do, and by thy grace, we will. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You may be seated. We, um, is it not on? I don't think I did turn it on. Thank you. We've been talking about grace. That's our theme for this year. And we started about three, four weeks ago, I believe it was, about sustaining grace. And, of course, we started with saving grace. And, of course, that's where it has to start. It has to start with being saved by grace and thank. Thankfully, God doesn't save you because you deserve it. He saves you because you don't deserve it. And that is the way it all begins. But then from there, not only are you saved by grace, but then you have to learn to live by grace. And one aspect of grace that you need to learn to live by is God's sustaining grace. And what that means is that word sustaining has the idea of, of in spite of your circumstances, God's grace can help you to be Come perfect to mature you, to establish you, to strengthen you, to settle you. That's what sustaining grace does. No matter how hard it gets, grace will sustain you because God wants us to be a trophy of His grace. He wants us to, He wants to manifest His grace. He wants people to see the grace of God in your life so that they that will create an appetite in the people around you so that they'll want that grace and want what you have. And that is what grace is for, to not only help you, but to help others through you. And that's what sustaining grace can do. Now, the first area we looked at where sustaining grace can help you is that it can help you when you are tempted. We looked there in the scriptures a moment ago that we need to be sober, we need to be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. I think most of us understand the devil wants to take you out. He wants, to, he wants to take you out to lunch. He wants to tear you into pieces spiritually because the one thing he does not want, he does not want one Christian who's already been saved by grace to grow in grace because he doesn't want anybody else to get saved. And he knows that your life can make a difference in other people's life. You can be a witness. You can be an epistle known and read of all men where people look at your life, they read your life, and they read the grace of God in your life. And God uses that as a sermon. There's that old kid's uh, song, Do You Know a Christian is a Sermon in Shoes? And that we are. We're sermons in shoes everywhere we go. People are reading our life. And hopefully they're, when they read you, they are seeing the grace of God working in your life. But you are going to be tempted. You are going to be tried. You're going to be tested. And so it is sustaining grace that will help you to continue to go on as you are tempted by the devil. In fact, in verse number 5, 
God tells us, be clothed in humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. That's why you need to get rid of your pride. Uh, if you think, you know, I can, I can do it without God's help. I can do it without the Bible. I can do it without prayer. I can do it without going to church. I'm going to tell you something. You are not going to make it as a child of God. And you are going to be mincemeat for the devil. So you have to understand, you have to humble yourself before God. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. All the resources of the kingdom of heaven are at your disposal if you will simply learn to humble yourself before the Lord. His hand will exalt you. His hand will lift you up. His grace will do all of that for you. And so when temptation comes, find grace. There is grace at the throne of grace to help you in your time of of need. Amen? And you got to come boldly to the throne of grace. By the way, you need to do that every day. Every day, every morning, I ask God to fill me with His grace, to give me His power that I might live for Him and, and, and fight off the temptations and the desires of this flesh and the fiery darts of the devil and the luring of this world. So you need grace to do that. And so, tempted. When you are tempted, sustaining grace will help you. And then we started looking at the second thing, and this may be one of the most important things because this is subtly, and actually the devil will use this to bring you down. Listen, sustaining grace will help you when you are ticked. Okay, when you get mad and you get upset about things in your life, the devil can use that in your life. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 15, in fact, turn there if you would, please, we'll be looking at that again. Hebrews 12, 15, very important verse regarding the grace of God, the sustaining grace of God when you are ticked. And it says here, looking diligently, notice, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Powerful verse. Listen, the devil wants you to get ticked. He wants you to get upset about something. Or uh, uh, the Bible talks about how um, it is inevitable that you are going to be offended. You are going to be hurt. Somebody's going to do something, whether it be on purpose or accidentally, is going to do something to hurt you, and you will get upset about that. And if you are not careful, when you get upset about something, you don't, let, you don't deal with it by the grace of God, and so you plant a seed in your heart that becomes a root, and that root is the root of bitterness. And it will destroy you. It will wrap its roots around your heart and squeeze your heart and suck every bit of spiritual life that you have. Wants to destroy you. Bitterness will destroy you. I talked about uh, the fact that we uh, had in our house when, in California, in Bakersfield, we had a fence along the alleyway there, and we had these uh, nice, beautiful floral bushes. But one day I noticed that there was a little plant coming out, and I didn't know it at the time, but it was actually a palm tree. It wasn't the big, long palm trees that you see a lot in California, but it was one of those real stocky ones. Actually, they usually don't get much higher than my, where my hand is right here, but the, but the bottom part of it gets huge. And the, by the way, they're very expensive. The buy one is super expensive to have put in. And so I, I saw it one day, and I thought to myself, you know what, I need to, I need to get rid of that, but I don't have time right now. And so I let it go, and um, I let it go, and I let it go, and I let it go, and I let it go for several years. And it came a point where that thing became so big. You say, why did you get it? I don't know. You know, th that's not me. Typically, I like to have everything look nice in my yard, but I just let it go for some reason. And finally, I got to the place where I thought, you know, I need to get this out. And I asked a guy who does that kind of stuff how much it would cost to get that thing out, he told me the price. I said, I'll keep it. I wasn't willing to pay the price to get it out. And there are a heap of people that were hurt 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 
40 years ago. And, and, and they, they thought, you know, and, and, and we'll get into that in a minute. They got ticked. And they didn't do anything about it. And it grew. And it grew. And it grew. And now 20, 30, 40 years, 5 years, 10 years, a year ago, and now it's, it's grown and the roots are wrapped around its, their heart. And you know what? They don't have the strength to pull it out. And because they've allowed it to grow, they have not availed of the grace of God to pull it out. And it's zapping them of their life, and they have grace available to them, but they're not willing to pay the price for it. And so we need to learn how to get out that root of bitterness. And you may have something that has hurt you for 30 years, 40 years, you may have something that hurt you last week. You may have something that hurt you this morning. And I'm going to tell you something. You need to learn to get it out. So number one, how are in the world are we going to deal, to pull the root of bitterness out by grace? Number one, there are three points. Number one, when God reveals it, deal with it. When God reveals it, deal with it. With it. That's why he said, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Now, it is tough for people, and they struggle admitting that they have bitterness. And people, let, and, and, listen, I, I can think of, I, I see their faces, I can hear their voices. I, I remember being in their house trying to deal with the, the gall of bitterness. When you are in the gall of bitterness, the Bible says you're also in the bond of iniquity. So if you are a bitter person, I guarantee you're dealing with other sins also. And if you're not willing to deal with that root of bitterness, then you're always going to struggle with other sins in your life. And there are many times I've, I've dealt with people and they're, they're struggling in this area, struggling in their marriage, struggling in other things in their life. And, and I try to tell them, you know, you know what it is? The, the root of the problem is you have a bitterness in your heart. And they, and they like to say, oh, pastor, I don't have bitterness. But they do. See, the problem is they, they don't see it. And, and that's the thing about a root. A root, it's hard to see. It grows quickly, and it's hard to remove. And a lot of times it's been there so long, they, they, they get used to it. But, but, and I don't have time to go through it, but there are many things that you think, the way you react to things shows that you have a bitter spirit. And there are different things that happen that it produces. That's why the Bible says we should constantly be looking for any seed of bitterness especially if someone ticks us off. Now, when I saw that palm tree, that little bitty thing, Brother Ruckel, I, I think back to those days, and, and, and I remember when, when it was real big and I got the price, and I, I thought to myself, if I, the, if I would have just reached down, well, that first time that I saw it, and I could have taken it out with two fingers, a finger and a thumb, and just, I probably could have just pulled it out it wouldn't have been nothing it would have been so easy to deal with but I didn't do it and I let it grow and I let it grow and I let it grow and the longer you wait to deal with bitterness the harder time you're going to have to deal with it later the longer you wait the harder it's going to get and so what do you do you deal when you when you see it when you recognize it, you, you deal with it. Sometimes people will say, well, I know my heart and there's no bitterness in it. Here's the problem with that. The Bible says you don't know your heart. You don't know your heart. By the way, that's why the grace of God is so important. Because the wonderful thing about grace, when you come to church and you come to a church like this, where the preacher is preaching and showing you what the Bible says, it may not even be on bitterness. But it's so often you come to church and the Holy Spirit will reveal other things in your life while he's preaching the word of God. And when that bitterness is revealed, you got to deal with it. Jeremiah said, said in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful. 
above all things and desperately wicked? He said, who can know it? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is simple, nobody. But listen to what the next verse says. It says, I, the Lord, search the hearts. I, he said, I try the reins. So God says, listen, you don't know your heart, but I know your heart. And God says, I'm, I search your heart. I try your reins and your motives. And God, by his and that's one of the things about God. God's always looking out for you. God's always, and he wants to show you the things in your heart and in your life. That's why coming to church on a regular basis, you, you, you put your heart out there. We had, we had I Love My Church Sunday with that big old heart up there. I said, everybody bring your heart. That's a reality every single Sunday, every single service. Bring your heart, put it before the Lord, and say what David said, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my heart. Thoughts. And so a deceitful heart cannot diagnose the deceit that's in it. Only God's grace can do that. Only God in His grace can do that by the working of the Holy Spirit inside of you and revealing that to you. And He will show you. If you want to know, He'll show you. Amen? Problem is a lot of Christians don't want to know. And they don't want to deal with it. And I think there are Christians that come to church all the time. I'm thinking of somebody a few weeks ago, Brother Lislin preached. And this person had been dealing with something for 40 years. And the problem was there, something that happened 40 years ago. They hadn't dealt with it. Praise God, they dealt with it. Amen. And that happens so much. And so that's the first thing you need to do. When you see that need, deal with that need, but deal with it by the grace of God, which is number two. Number two, let grace deal with it. Don't you deal with it. Let grace deal with it. Grace has more power. Grace is the power to do the will of God. God will help you to do what needs to be done to get that bitterness out. He, what does he say? He says in verse uh, there in Hebrews chapter 12, he says, Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Listen, lest any man fail of the grace of God. We need to let God's sustaining grace deal with the root of bitterness. How many ever heard of a the stuff that's called Roundup? Anybody ever heard of Roundup? If you love your yard, you love Roundup. Amen? Oh my, I'm a professional Roundup guy. I use it all the time. Used to use it all the time. I just got weeds everywhere in the house I have now, so it almost seems wasteful to, to use it. But what does Roundup do? Roundup, you spray it on the green leaves, and the substance that's in that Roundup goes through the pores of that leaves, and it goes all the way down to the what? It goes down to the root. And so you, now you could go and you could pull up, you could pull that plant out, maybe just kind of cut it down. Only problem is the root's still there. And it's going to come right back. People on the surface deal sometimes with bitterness. But my friend, the way to get rid of bitterness, you got to get to the root of the matter. And that's what Roundup does. By the way, I've never seen Roundup fail. Never have seen it. Now, you know, if, you're gonna, if, it's gonna, if it's gonna rain that day, then it's gonna fail. But if you use it the way it's directed to be used, if you read the directions, it tells you exactly what to do. You do it exactly the way the directions say. You know what? You're gonna get rid of those roots every single time. And the weeds are gone. See, grace is God's roundup. It is, that's what grace is. Grace is God's roundup. And God wants you to take his grace. See, the truth is grace will never fail you. The problem is we fail to avail of the grace of God. We fail to take that grace and say, God, give me grace so I can forgive. Give me grace so I can get this, this anger in my heart towards somebody, this bitterness in my heart towards somebody, this, this ill will towards somebody, this, this chip on my shoulder towards somebody. Lord, give me the grace to get rid of this 
So I don't have to deal with this anger in my heart. So by grace, ask God to forgive you for allowing the root of bitterness to be planted in your heart. By grace, cut it down and pluck it up. By forgiveness, that person, and then forget it. I think about the churches in the book of Acts. We had two churches. We looked at the church in Jerusalem, primarily Jews. We looked at the church in Antioch, primarily Gentiles. And in both of those churches, we learned last week that they were, they were filled with the grace of God. The Bible says that they had great grace that was upon them. And so that means that they showed grace in action. And one of the things that you know that church had is those people were showing grace to each other. Listen, you cannot get a bunch of sinners together without having somebody hurt somebody else. I mean, it, it, just, it, it, it comes with the program. And, and, and sometimes Christians will do things and say things. Again, sometimes on purpose, sometimes not. Many times they don't realize they're hurting somebody. And so that's where God says these people were filled with grace. And that means that they were showing grace to each other. When somebody hurt somebody, I have to believe they went up to them and they did what they were supposed to do to deal with it right away. And you need to have grace to deal with people. Because you know what? Nobody lives on an island all by themselves. And there are always going to be people in your life, be it on your job, be it in your family, be it in your church, be it in your neighborhood. And you've got to have grace. Showing grace means in this instant we give those who hurt us good when they deserve bad. That's what grace is. You give to somebody good when what they truly deserve is bad. Isn't that what Jesus did for us? He gave us something good when we deserved to go to hell. That's the grace of God. God's always, do by the way, he's always doing that, isn't he? He's always giving us good when we deserve what is bad. Oh my. Grace means we take it off the table. Forgiveness means we take it off the table and remove it to never use it against that person again. Forgiveness means that the matter is settled. I will not dwell on that anymore. That's what grace does. Grace causes us and enables us to be able to forgive and settle the matter once and for all. And that's where people fail. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to let grace Deal with it. Two ways sustaining grace can help you. Two choices that you have to avoid bitterness. Number one, choose not to take offense. You have two choices. First choice is choose not to take offense. Um, uh, look, look over at Luke 17 again, if you would, please. I want you to use your Bible here a little bit. You don't mind using your Bible, do you? Okay, Luke, Luke chapter 7, verse 1. We've looked at this verse before. And this is so good. I love this. Choose not to take offense. It says here, Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but the offenses will come. He says it's impossible. You're going to get offended. Somebody is going to hurt you. How many Christians have left good churches because somebody offended them? My goodness. And end up destroying their life and destroying their family because somebody said something, somebody did something. Again, Jesus is warning his disciples that you are going to be offended. But here's the choice. You can choose to say, you know what, I'm not going to allow this offense to hurt me. I'm going to make that choice. L look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 1. Scriptures teach us this all the time. It says in verse 1 of Ephesians chapter 4, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, the calling, wherewith ye are called. Then he says with all lowliness, these are great words right here, with all lowliness, that's humility, being humble, and meekness, which also could be the word gentleness, power under control. In other words, you could say something, 
but you choose not to say something. Amen? You could do something, but you choose not to do something. That's what, that's what meekness is. You have the power. You just choose not to. And then look at this. With long-suffering, that's pretty simple to understand. Somebody has described long-suffering as having a long fuse before you lose your temper, before you say something you ought not to say. But the, the, next, the word I want to get at is the next word. Forbearing one another in what? In love. Forbearing. What does the word forbearing mean? It means to put up with. It means to not take action. It means... Just let it go. Just let it go. You're going to be hurt. You just mark it down. You're going to be offended. Things are going to happen in your life. You know what? You know what you could do? Just let it go. Just let it go. Say, ah, he's a jerk anyway. <laughs> and just, just let that thing go. You ought to expect to be offended. You ought to expect to be hurt. Hey, uh, I've been hurt many times. But I have always chosen I am not going to have to, I'm not going to let that offend me. I'm not going to let it. Hey, I've got, I've got too good a life to let anything like that destroy me. Amen? I'm not going to let that, that offense plant a seed in my heart that will begin to destroy my spiritual life. So you can let it go. Forbearing. That takes, by the way, it takes grace to do that. That is not normal. What's normal? I'm going to get him. I'm going to get her. I'm going to show them. I'm going to say this. No, it's supernatural. You say, you know what? I, I, I'm not going to let that offend. Maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they just don't realize that what they said hurt me. I'm just going to let that thing go. God tells, God does that, again, God does that all the time. God, you know how many things God lets go in your life? Huh? You know how many times, you know how many, can you imagine how many times God is up in heaven looking down at me and say, I'll just let that one go. You say God's soft on sin? God is not soft on sin. He remembers that we are but flesh. He knows that. He knows at best I'm a sinner saved by grace. God doesn't condone sin. Please don't get me wrong. There, uh, uh, look over, turn over to Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse number 4. Everybody doing okay? God does this all the time. Amen. I'm glad. I'm glad God isn't like you. Amen. Every little thing, you let it get to you and you get upset about it. They didn't talk to me. They didn't do this. Man, I was right there. I was going to shake their hand and they turned away from me. Ah! You say, that never happened. Are you kidding me? Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 4. Or, or He's talking about the Jews primarily here. He says, or, or despisest thou the riches. Again, these words are so beautiful to me. Uh, despisest thou the riches of his, what's that word? Oh, aren't you glad God is good? David said, I, I, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Then he says, and what's that next word? Forbearance. What is that? Just let it go. Just let it go. I'm not going to let that bother me. And long suffering, I'm not going to get mad. I'm going to count to a thousand. Short fuse, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to what? Repentance. When some, oh my goodness, this is so good. When somebody hurts you, here's what you need to stop and think. I hurt God every single day. And God still, oh my goodness, I think about 
dummy, dummy, dummy me, dumb things I do sometimes, dumb things I think sometimes, and yet he still answers my prayers. And he's still good to me. And when I think, and that's why every morning when you get up and you have your time with the Lord and you come back tonight, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But you, that's why you need to take time to thank God and praise God for who he is. Because by the time you're done, then you're ready to say, Lord, I'm so sorry for my stupid attitude and the dumb things I say and do. When you focus on the goodness and the forbearance and the long-suffering of God, it is going to begin to convict your heart that you would ever be unkind to anybody. And it causes you to what? Repent. Repent. To turn from that sin. Whatever it may be. Lord, you are so good to me. You forgive me. How can I keep this in my heart towards this person? How can I be so unforgiving? How could I be so unkind? And you repent of that. That's what he's saying. Listen, if you want to avoid bitterness, then just decide, I am not going to be offended. That's my choice. Go ahead. Call me names. Six and stones will break by bones, but names will never hurt me. It's biblical. Well, it is true. In some ways, it's supposed to be true, Brother Don. I'm just saying, you're going to get hurt. Somebody is going to offend you. Something is going to happen. Mark my words. Why don't you maybe choose to say, all right, I'm not going to let that bother me. I'm, I'm going to let it like water off a duck's back. I'm going to just let it roll off me. Amen. I'm just going to turn the other cheek and say, praise the Lord, I'm saved. And God is good to me. And God forgives me every day. And God puts up with things in my life that I would not want anybody to know. Romans 3.25, talking about Israel, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. See, God actually just let the sins of Israel go till the Day of Atonement. The Bible says he winked his eye. He kind of closed his eyes at it until that day would come when the sacrificial lamb would be sacrificed and the blood of that lamb would be taken into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled on the mercy seat. And when, then when God would finally open his eyes, he didn't see their sin. He saw the blood. He saw that blood, and that blood had a rake, got rid of all that sin, and that's what he does for you every single day. So how in the world can you hold a grudge towards anybody? How in the world can you keep that hatred in your heart towards it? How can you do that? After what God does for you. It doesn't make sense, really. Grace means we give those who hurt us good when they deserve bad. That's what grace is. Oh, 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 look, look at Proverbs 19. Look at Proverbs 19. This is a great verse. Everybody ought to underline this verse. Oh, Lord, I'm never going to finish this. Never. I feel like I'm just totally... Ugh. Proverbs 19, 11. Look at this. This is a great verse. The discretion... The discretion of a man deferreth his what? His anger. Notice that. And it is, and, and it is his glory to what? Pass over a what? Transgression. You know what a transgression is? Transgression is when somebody purposely does something wrong to hurt you. Sin is missing the mark. I didn't mean to, but I missed the mark. I want to hit the bullseye, but I missed the mark. Transgression is, I wanted to miss the mark. I wanted to, get a, I wanted to get totally off the bullseye and shoot you. That's what it is. But look what he says, discretion. We could put the word understanding in there. We could also put the word grace in there. We could put the word wisdom in there. Of a man, that discretion brought on by grace causes him to overlook the wrong someone has done to him and the glory for that person is it doesn't make him look good 
it makes the grace of God look good in his life. He becomes, listen, when, you, when somebody hurts you and you could retaliate, you could say something, you could do something, but your choice is I am going to pass over that thing, I am going to leave it alone, and I am going to show grace towards that brother or grace towards that sister or grace towards that family member. And you know what it is? It is going to be glory of God's grace in your life. Somebody going to say, wow, God's really worked in that man's life. That's what it is. So you can avoid bitterness by not taking offense. We're going to have to stop there. Now listen to me. If you've been hurt, if somebody hurt you just recently, I'll give you the one, next, second one next week. Why don't you just decide, you know what, Lord, I'm just not, you don't deal with everything in my life, and I'm not going to deal with everything in everybody else's life. I'm just going to let some things go. You know what? You'd be such a happier person. And you would so much enjoy life. And even better than that, you would enjoy people more. You know, everybody deserves to be given grace. Everybody deserves the benefit of the doubt. Brother, listen, no, I've said it. Sometimes people do it, something, and I'll say or I'll think, you know what, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to try to think the best of them. Uh, Mrs. Evans had a plaque up on her classroom that said, there's a little bit of gold in everybody. There's a little bit of gold in everybody, which means I'm always trying to look at the good in people. See, the difference between Christians who have grace and those that don't, they're always trying to look at the bad in people. But when you have grace... You're always trying to find the good in them. And I believe, you know, the Bible says that every man will find his praise when they get to heaven. I don't understand that, but everybody in some way is going to be praised by God. I'm talking about the person who quit going to church or the person who fell into sin. God, I love God. I love God. One of the reasons I love him so much is that he's all, he, when I get to heaven... He's going to find some good things to praise me for. Amen? I might have done a lot of dumb things, but he'll, he'll say, but Joe, you did good here. Thank you, Lord. I, but what about all those bad things? Let's not look at the bad stuff. We're in heaven now. We're in heaven now. Forget all that stuff. Don't worry about it. But I, boy, you did this good. And boy, that was great what you did right there. You know what that is, folks? What is it? grace that's grace and that's the same kind of grace that you need to have wherever that whoever that person is done you wrong just say you know what i'm not even going to worry about it let god take care of that let's bow our heads for prayer our heads about our eyes are closed i wonder this morning and certainly must ask do you know you're saved do you know you're going to heaven when you die do you know that you know that you've been born again and you can think back to that day and that moment in your life and it's as clear as if it was yesterday. I, got, I bowed my head, I bent my knee, I, it was in church, it was a camp, it was in my house, it was visiting a family member, but I prayed and I accepted Jesus Christ into my heart as my personal Savior. Pastor, I know today without a shadow of a doubt that if I died today that I would go to heaven. Is that your testimony this morning? Would you raise your hand good and high and say, Pastor, that's me. I can remember that. I don't know the date, but I know the day. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Lower your hand. Now, if you could not raise your hand, then why in the world don't you just take care of that right now? Why are you going day after day after day without getting it settled once and for all? God loves you. God knows everything about you. God knows all your past. God knows you better than you know yourself. So why not this morning come down here and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior? I wonder if there's someone say, Pastor.